Good evening and welcome to our Bible study. We're very glad that you could join us. So I'm with Dr. Mark Nemo and I'm Father Matt, pastor here at St. Columbanus. Uh, and this evening it's an opportunity for us just to continue to break open God's word with one another, especially as we were studying this fifth chapter of Acts of the Apostles. Mm. So as we gather this evening, let's just take a moment to put ourselves in the presence of God and to pray with one another. And so we pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Most gracious and loving God, we, we give you thanks and praise this day. We thank you for the blessings that you continue to shower upon us. We thank you for the gift of life, and we thank you for the ministry that you're calling each of us to. And so we ask you, Lord, that as we gather for this time of study, that you open our minds, our hearts, our spirits, so that we might receive your word in our life this moment. We thank you, Lord, for the great witnesses of all those ancestors who have come before us. We thank you, Lord, for reminding us how you're calling us to share your life and your love in our world. And so we just ask you, Lord, to be with us and bless us as we pray together through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much, Father. So let's hear from you, okay? If you have any questions or anything, please keep sending them to us. You know, if there are any testimonies as well about the ways that you're being nourished, Send it to Father, to the parish uh, website, and then we, we will acknowledge that. Okay, so Acts chapter 5. We're continuing the story after Pentecost. Okay, so the Holy Spirit has come upon the early church, and things are happening. In order to, to kind of pick it up in chapter 5, it might be helpful to, to, to already just read a bit of Acts 4.36. So... Last week, this is how we ended. Acts chapter 4, verse 36 says, Thus Joseph, also named by the apostles Barnabas. Do you remember that name? Which is translated son of encouragement. A Levite, a Seaproite by birth. Sold a piece of property that he owned. Then brought the money and put it at the feet of the apostles. It's very, very important. Father, the expression of he put it at the feet of the apostles. Can you break it open for us a little bit? If you bring something, you put it at the feet of. <laughs> so, I mean, it was really him making this offering mm -hmm. uh, that was meant to be for the good of the whole community. Mm -hmm. uh, and in a real way, I mean, that's what we continue to do, even as we gather for, for worship on Sundays and we share our offerings, our that's tithes right. with each other. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what it means to bring it and put it at the feet of the apostles. And then now... We continue with the story. So in Acts chapter 5, we're now introduced to a couple. Their names are Ananias and Sapphira. Okay? So let's read from maybe verse 1 through to 11. And then you begin to, to contrast. Because Barnabas sold his property. He brings it and puts it at the feet of the apostles. But in contrast, let's see what happens with Ananias and Sapphira. So could you help us, Father, at verse 1 through to 11? But a man named Ananias, with the consent of his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of property. With his wife's knowledge, he kept back some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Ananias, Peter asked, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, were not the proceeds at your disposal? How is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You did not lie to us, but to God. Now when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard of it. The young men came and wrapped up his body, then carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter said to her, Tell me whether you and your husband sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, Yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and died. When the young men came in, they found her dead, so they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear seized the whole church 
and all who heard of these things. After reading like this, you hear the word of the Lord. <laughs> what do you say? Thanks be to, Thanks God. Be to God. Because it's, it's the word of the Lord and people, you know, falling dead and all that. That's, that's amazing. That's amazing. What was the crime of Ananias and Sapphira? What, what did they do? You know, what did they do that really kind of upset Peter so badly? Yeah. Deception. Deception was a big thing. Lying was a big thing. A selfishness. But, but it's interesting, you know, how Peter put it. And I asked, why has Satan filled your heart so that you lied to the Holy Spirit? So, so there's this, this whole connection. Another part for his wife, he says, you know, you, you're testing the spirit of the Lord. So there's this whole connection with the body of Christ, you know, the spirit of God, God, and all that. So, I think this is this is huge. This is huge. They had the freedom to keep all the money, isn't it? So, it wasn't like they were under some compulsion to do it. But it's the deception of keeping some and coming to tell us, this is all you got out of it. I think this is, this is the big thing. This is the big thing. Now, in case probably <laughs> we're surprised at the turn of events. I mean, there was nothing like calling a funeral home, <laughs> informing the next of kin, <laughs> getting, what do you call it? Corona? The coroner. Corona, yeah, coroner's, what do you call it? Report, cause of death. What would the cause of death have been? <laughs> Heart attack? <laughs> I mean, this is, this is amazing. But this is all happening in the midst of, you know, kind of an early church that was so filled with the Spirit of God, so filled with the power of God. And what struck me as I was preparing had a lot to do with, you know, Satan. Why has Satan filled your heart? Because, you know, Jesus himself referred to Satan as the father of lies. John 8, 44. John chapter 8, verse 44, you know, it speaks about the father of lies. And I think the lying that Ananias and his wife are going through here really make them close to like children of, of the deceiver because that's another name. I just want us to focus a little bit on because that's what Satan, you know, as the father of lies, the deceiver, uh, the accuser, I think that's what that's what Satan means, huh? Mm. The accuser, the one who accuses. But but he's also the deceiver, the one who divides. The one who divides. And the early church was big on unity, you know. They were one of one heart, one mind, and therefore this deception, this lie was really like you you're following who who your father is, the father of lies, Satan. John 8 44. So, so that really upset Peter. And, but how? Okay. So, Father, what would you say about what happened to Ananias and his wife? Would you, would you say they were punished by God? Because that's a legitimate question to ask. You know, were their lives taken by God or what, what was it? What, 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 what's, what's your. Because we're trying to seek understanding here. <laughs> All of us are trying to yeah, seek understanding yeah. here. No, I think that the the story, especially as you know, it's put up against the how chapter four ends. Yes, it is this reminder um, of of the importance of actually living for the community. Yeah. And like you're saying, that's what I think the the early community was about. That's what they were focused on. It's also right after Pentecost is when this is taking place. So there's this whole conversation that keeps going on in the life of the community about the gift of the Holy Spirit and the importance of everyone living in that spirit. Yeah. Um, I think this isn't the first time in the Bible that we've heard yeah. about people who were who, struck who struck who were struck dead because they didn't do what it was that yeah. God was asking them to do. And I think that especially when you read in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, there's all sorts of stories of God. The guy who touched God. the Ark of the Covenant, you mm -hmm. remember? Yeah. Yeah, and so I think that that's definitely a theme that, that runs throughout. Um, but I don't know. I don't know if 
you know, we take it literally, yeah. you know, that they were there and they were struck dead as a punishment? Or was it that they were so overwhelmed with, you know, what they yeah. did in that moment that they suffered a heart attack and, yeah. and fell dead at that moment? But I think for the community that witnessed it, um, it was probably, you know, it, it says, you know, fear sees them. Yes. Um, I mean, I think if any of us witness somebody die right in front of us, Great fear would see us. <laughs> it's, it's very traumatic to witness something like that. Um, but this pride that they had and this, this lying that they had, you know, is really destroying the life of the community. Yes, yes, yes. You, 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 you know of the scripture, Romans 6, 23, the wages of, death, of, of sin is death, mm -hmm. but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Talking about the idea of communio or koinonia, you know, the, the essence of the community, that big thing. Again, you know how Paul also writes, particularly in the context of the Eucharist, in 1 Corinthians 11, when he speaks about many of you have died. You know, when he speaks about because you have not discerned the body and blood which you've received. Yeah, and I'm beginning to think about, normally when the scriptures speak about death, you know, there is, there is, there is this death, physical death, but there's also the second death, the death of our souls, you know, and I think we, we really, we really need, need to take heed a little bit about this because if, if we look overall in terms of the sovereignty of God and what can happen to us sometimes when, when we, we really go against the will of God, uh, you never know. Because none of us knows <laughs> when when our time will be up, and uh, and what what I fear the most, I think this coming Sunday the gospel reading, you know, has a lot to do with be afraid of the one who can kill the body and also kill the soul. But he tells them, do not be afraid. To the early church, I mean, do not be afraid of the one who can only kill the body and not. You know, not can do anything to the soul. Be afraid of the one who can kind of kill the body and the soul. So it, it's really worth reflecting on this. And I think what, what we need to strongly kind of look at is, you know, deception and lying. I don't think we, we need to encourage that at all in our midst, you know. If, if, that's why God loves a cheerful giver. Isn't that what Paul says? Yeah, so... Mm -hmm. Freely you have received, but, but don't come and lie. Don't come and deceive. And of course, you want to encourage people to be open, but I think if, if they recorded this in the scriptures, it's for our instruction. Mm -hmm. You know, what is it that God is teaching us? We, we certainly, we don't want to be on the side of the father of lies, like Jesus always kind of speaks about okay so let's continue but i think that yes the, i just have yeah please it's, it's yes. okay yeah okay please but i think that it also you know it, it, it reinforces this message that the early church would have really believed mm -hmm. but i think that we've lost sight of mm -hmm. which is that jesus is coming again jesus is going to return and you know for those who were there in those weeks months years mm -hmm. immediately after jesus's death and resurrection they lived with this anticipation that there was going to come a day when the Son of Man was going to return in glory. Um, and I think that's how we're supposed to be living as people of faith, you know. But for these last 2,000 years, we've been waiting, right, for Jesus' return. I think that, you know, this story here in chapter 5, it, it does reinforce that early message of the church. Because why withhold what you can give to the apostles because mm. it's not about giving it to them as individuals yes. it's about giving to the community it's about giving to the ministry that they were perform performing for the people so why would you hold back from that mm -hmm. if you really believe that jesus is coming again that mm -hmm. there's going to come a day when you know we're, we're brought into the fullness of life why hold back sure. the blessings or, or why not trust that god's going to take care of you um and i think you know they're dying in that moment after the deception and the lying and their selfishness and their lack of commitment in some mm -hmm. ways to the life of the community mm -hmm. i think it just 
probably would, would, would have reminded that early community and maybe teaches us just how vulnerable we are yes. and how nothing's promised to us mm. but this moment. And so that, that constant tension, I think, in the spiritual life of trying to, to live but also to give mm. to the community, to mm. recognize that we're not meant to hold on to the things of this world, but that doesn't say we're not meant to enjoy life, yeah. but it's really about where do we place our trust? Yeah. Is it just in ourself and mm. in our stuff, or is it in the life of the community and, and what, what the Spirit is doing mm. for all of us? I love that, I love that. The anticipation, the urgency, you know, it's like we, we're constantly you know, I think the book of Hebrews speaks about the idea of this, this, this earth is not our home. Mm -hmm. You know, we are made for a heavenly city, you know. Book of Hebrews, Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews speaks about that. And so I think there's, there's a self-emptying, the kenosis, you know, that's the Greek word for Christ himself is our example. He, he didn't hold on, he didn't grasp. But he said, emptied himself, Philippians chapter 2. So I think this is very key. Thank you for, for, for bringing that. And then our vulnerability, you know, because everything can be taken away in a moment, including even our own lives. And look at COVID-19 and what we have to deal with. Okay, very good. So we have to grapple with some of these things and, and say thanks be to God as we hear, as we hear the gospel. So, yeah. So verse 12 of Acts 5, now signs and wonders. So what's going on? Let's read from maybe verse 12 through to uh, 16. Uh, yeah, can we, can we take it over? Now many signs and wonders were done among the people through the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared to join them, but the people held them in high esteem. Yet more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, great numbers of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats in order that Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he came by. A great number of people would also gather from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all cured. Amazing. So signs and wonders is one thing that characterized the early church, you know? that the outpouring of the Spirit also brought in charisms, gifts of the Spirit, healing, exorcism, you know, which was very characteristic of Jesus himself, you mm -hmm. know. Remember during his ministry, I think it was Matthew chapter 10, you know, the whole experience, the sending out of the, of the early disciples, Jesus gave them authority, right? Even before his death and resurrection, he gave them authority over unclean spirits. You know, where do you find that? I think Matthew chapter, chapter 10. 10. Yeah. What what verses are they? Verse 1. Okay. So so this is this is part of part of what the kingdom should look like, you know? Characteristics of the kingdom are, are these. And Jesus himself demonstrated it in his time. And now as he has passed on, you know, this this kingdom to the apostles and the early church, they are living it. So, so Matthew chapter 10 says, Then he summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to cure every disease and every illness. Bingo, there you are. So, so it's amazing to think of the fact that even the shadow, mm -hmm. the shadow of Peter would, would bring healing to people. Isn't that amazing? I mean, and friends, this is this is this is nothing <laughs> strange because this should be actually the normal. Okay, to not have this happening in the church is abnormal. <laughs> did, did you hear me? I mean, all throughout the history of the church, Father, we've heard of saints, right? I mean, who Padre Pio. I mean, he died only in 1968. I think I was just four years old. But so, so we've had people living in our day. He was a stigmatist, isn't it? So he had the five wounds of Christ, just like St. Francis of Assisi. And there have been, there've been a lot of stigmatists even within the church. Great, great gifts of healing. Padre Pio, you know, the stories go, he could sit in the confessional for sometimes, you know, 20 hours. He could read souls. You would make your confession and he would tell you 
How about this? How about that? Why, why, are, you, why are you deceiving God? For some people, he will tell them, get up and go away because you're not ready for this. You think we're playing here. I mean, it, it's amazing how people filled with the Spirit can really do amazing things. Of course, his body is incorruptible. His body has been exhumed. And he's, he's lying there like that. So I think from time to time, God shows us these glimpses see, of people that he can raise. But this should be normal for all the baptized. Especially this must be really present in the whole body. And that his shadow would... would, would Unclean spirits will be will be will, will leave. This is amazing. This is amazing. So thank God, and we we pray for probably just kind of like a recapturing of this spirit in the church, because all of us have different gifts. Some might have the gift of healing. I I know I know I know of a couple of priests who are exorcists, like in this diocese, designated exorcists and all that. And, it's a ministry that I think, or deliverance, we need to really recapture some of these things. Uh, so let's continue. Verse 17. Uh, Miss Kimberly, you want to scream and shout and <laughs> read that for us? Is that okay? Verse 17 through to maybe 32. It's quite a long one. Let's go. Then the high priest rose up and all his companions, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, laid hands upon the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, the angel of the Lord opened the doors of the prison, led them out and said, go and take your place in the temple area and tell the people everything about this life. When they heard this, they went to the temple early in the morning and taught. When the high priest and his companions arrived, they convened the Sanhedrin, the full senate of the Israelites, and sent to the jail to have them brought in. But the court officers who went did not find them in the prison, so they came back and reported. We found the jail securely locked and the guards stationed outside the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. When they heard this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss about them as to what this would come to. Then someone came in and reported to them, the men whom you put in prison are in the temple area and are teaching the people. Then the captain and the court officers went and brought them in, but without force, because they were afraid of being stoned by the people. When they had brought them in and made them stand before the Sanhedrin, the high priest questioned them. We gave you strict orders, did we not, to stop teaching in that name? Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and want to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles said in reply, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus, though you had him killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to grant Israel repentance and forgiveness of sins. We are witnesses of these things, as is the Holy Spirit that God has given to those who obey him. Amen. Let's stop there for a moment. So. What, 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 as I was preparing, I thought of, I thought of this idea of <laughs> trouble. <laughs> okay. So the way of life got them into trouble. So I think the question here is, <laughs> can our way of life get us into trouble? You heard this before, Father, the idea of if, if, if you were arrested, could you be convicted or something? Could you be? There's, there's a saying that's going around about could could your way of life lead to a conviction that you know you're a follower of Jesus? There's there's something like that. So so the yeah, way of life got them into trouble. Of course, you know the the the, the Sanhedrin they were jealous, and it states that they were filled with jealousy, and the result of 
their way of living and way of acting, they got put in jail. But there was a jailbreak. <laughs> there was a jailbreak. The angel of the Lord. That, that's also another miracle. Another miracle. And and the, 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 just the humiliation, the torments that they went through. But Jesus did not, did not promise them anything different. You know? Acts 1.8. What does he say? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Then you will be my witnesses. Don't they say the word witness... The root word in Greek is, you'll be my martyrs. Mm. That's what being a witness is. You, you're, you're a martyr. You, you're willing to lay down your life. But you remember last week we were talking about boldness and how sometimes, you know, what is it that gives us the boldness? The boldness to act in this way. The courage. I heard uh, Father Michael Scallon preach the other day about the idea of Courage, you know, it's like le cœur in French is the heart. Mm -hmm. Okay, so courage is 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 to 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 act out of out of a conviction of the heart. You know, le cœur and agitate to agitate. You you see the whole thing, those two words. So I think in order to have the boldness and the courage to act even in the face of danger, it, it takes conviction. Father, can you speak to that? Where, where does that conviction come from? You know, that you believe to the extent that to the very core of your being, it's like nothing, nothing can change me. Nothing can shake me. I remember when we were in Uganda, there was a poster of, of a huge chimp, chimpanzee, you know, on, on, on the trunk of a car sitting like this. And <laughs> the caption was... <laughs> Don't confuse me with the facts. I've made up my mind. <laughs> it's like he was sitting like this. Don't confuse me with it. I think this is this is where it comes to. Father, speak to speak to that about courage and conviction. You know, where where does it come from? I think courage is definitely a gift of the spirit, mm -hmm. um, and much like faith, uh, it's a gift that we that we get to receive. But it's also something that we have to accept. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's okay. that's a huge piece of you know being able to surrender our heart yes. to God, being able to surrender our fears, being able to surrender our life, um, and, and really trusting that you know that who God is, God will be for us. So who God has always been, that mm -hmm. God's the one who, as we read in the Book of Deuteronomy, never leaves us, never forsakes us, never mm -hmm. abandons us. That God's the one who's always with us. Um, we see that in the, in the person of Jesus himself, that God comes to dwell among us, among his people. So if we really believe that about who God is, then what is there that we're afraid of? Um, and I think, you know, especially as we think about this question in our world today, especially living in this context of the United States, we don't have to be afraid mm -hmm. to Actually, preach and yeah. to profess what we believe. Um, we have, you know, legal rights that allow us, that guarantee us the, the opportunity to be able to do that. Yet, I think that for a lot of people, what we're afraid of is we're afraid of offending somebody else. Or we're afraid of not saying the right thing. Or mm -hmm. we're not exactly sure, you know, what it is that, that mm -hmm. we're supposed to be saying. And I think the apostles, they weren't perfect. I think that's an important reminder. Um, even with all the time that they got to spend with Jesus and, and witnessing, watching Jesus perform miracles and do this mm -hmm. mighty works, they still didn't quite understand it. Mm -hmm. um, but they had a, a faith about them, this, the conviction to say, no, I'm willing to leave everything behind to follow Jesus. I think it's, it's listening to that voice within, mm -hmm. feeling that sense of peace, of knowing like this is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing in this moment, even if it doesn't make sense, mm -hmm. even if it's going to take you into a place that's sort of unchartered and, and you haven't experienced it before, it's going to make you uncomfortable, um, but just really believing that mm -hmm. God is going to be with you through it all. And I think that takes time and it takes prayer and it takes silence and it takes sitting still. And I think it takes taking the risk, yeah. actually taking the risk and stepping out to, to explore and to discover and to imagine what God could be doing. Mm -hmm. Amazing. This is, this is the pastor speaking. I like the point you raised about gift. So, so I think first the gift must be received, just like faith. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, you, you liken 
courage to faith. So the gift must be received. But you made a point also about about the idea of, like you said, in prayer, in silence. That means it must be exercised. You see, it must be exercised in order for it to grow. I mean, it, 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 it's just, it's like everything, like the charisms, like everything. It must be exercised for it to grow and grow and grow. And it takes risk. Mm. I mean, Father, as you were speaking, I was thinking of even your call to the priesthood. You know, I mean, my call to the married state. Kimberly's call to the single life. You see, it takes courage every day. Every day to, to if you like, defend that. Because, because the culture we live in, if you like, <laughs> there used to be a time, where, what do we call this a post-Christian culture? There used to be a time where the culture was so accepting and accommodating. The culture would even kind of encourage you. But now, that's, that's not the norm. You know? Mm. What? You mean you're married? You mean you're stuck to just one woman? Or you mean you're stuck to just one man? You mean you're single? You mean you're not shacking? Yeah, I'm, excuse my French. But, but you understand what I'm saying? You mean you're going to be a... You're so handsome. Look at you. You're so young. Don't you want to have children? Why are, you, why are you getting yourself boxed into this vocation? Priesthood. And then you put on black. You, no colors. What, what is it? This is all your outfit? Father, but so it has to take some conviction every day to wake up and say, this is what I've decided to do. It's for the sake of the one who died for me. I, I, I think, I think you, you nailed it. You nailed it right there. But I think it's also, you know, you know my favorite is Sankofa. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, yeah. that, that, that this, that's a huge piece of this, you know. And, um, you know, being able to look back Mm-hmm. In order to be reminded what God has already done, what God has brought us through, yes. I think is what also helps people find courage mm-hmm. and helps us live with that conviction mm-hmm. about, you know, doing what it is that Jesus is calling us to do yes. in this moment. Not just with our vocation, but each and every day, how Jesus is inviting us to really make God's kingdom known here on earth. Mm-hmm. But when we remember where it is that we've come from, what it is that God has brought us through. Mm. You know, we think back to those moments that we think were probably, that was the most difficult thing that I've ever had to face. Mm-hmm. And how many times have we had to say that? Because mm-hmm. once we get through one thing, mm-hmm. there's no doubt going to be something else that comes along. And, and when you're in the midst of it, uh, it can be overwhelming. It can be scary. And I'm sure it was for the apostles too. Mm-hmm. Nobody wants to be sitting in jail, mm-hmm. locked up. Um, but they had to remember all the experiences that they've already had up until that moment and, and believing that, you know, God was going to intervene and, and was going to be present to them. And I think that's a piece of the growing in conviction, the exercise. It, it takes work, just like our vocations mm-hmm. take work. Our mm-hmm. life of faith takes work. Mm-hmm. It takes work to really remain in that courage because I think it's a lot easier to just give up. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a lot harder to really choose every single day to receive the gift of faith, to receive the gift of courage, and then to step out into the world, as crazy it is, as it is right now, and try to profess Jesus risen. Yes, yes. And I think, I think its relevance finds, finds a lot of credence, if you like, within the community. That's why the koinonia is very important, because mm-hmm. Jesus himself told them, you are in the world, but you are not okay. of the world. Do you remember that? The great priestly prayer in John 17, when he was praying, you know, Father, you know, I consecrate these to yourself. So I think for us, we, we, need, to, we need to find our identity. You always say it, in our baptism, and our baptism roots us within the body, you know, the, the, the mystical body. Mm-hmm. This is where we receive our teaching from. This is where it's like, that's where we are formed. Our consciences are formed within this believing community. So I think that's, that's so key. And, and, and when we have that, then we are growing. We're growing more into the likeness of Christ. I think 
This is this is this is the key here because our transformation is in Christ. Perfection in charity. Isn't that what holiness is? Mm -hmm. So I mean Second Corinthians three eighteen speaks about all of us huh, are being transformed from glory to glory. See? So our change is in Christ, that we become more Christ-like, but it's in the church. It's this koinonia that will give us this identity. And so when the angel causes that jailbreak, what does he tell them? Go and take your place in the temple area. Boy, you take getting us into trouble again? You know? And then, of course, you know, all that happens after that. But a question that kind of I raised out there is, what is keeping you locked up? See? Because these were the apostles. They were, they were really, you know, arrested and locked up in jail. But for us, the question is, what is keeping you locked up? I think this is so key. Because there are a lot of things that keep us locked up from becoming who we really are. What is keeping you locked up? Father, you raised one that I just wrote it down, Scandalion, you know, the whole idea of offense. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't want to offend anybody. Because we want to be liked. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to be liked. And, and Father, I pray for you always, particularly when you're a priest in this day and age. The question is, will, 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 will I offend somebody as I preach? I think it's also just, you know, yeah. when I wear the collar, yeah. you know, yeah. that offends people. Um, you know, going to the, the grocery store or any store uh, and being in my collar. And I think probably, I mean, it's never, it's not been my experience that what's normative is that people see me in this and are excited to see the priest. That happens, but it's not very often. Most of the time people are confused. And then there's other times when I think, when I've experienced, you know, people wanting to get away from me uh, or get their kids away from me um, just because of the witness of, of wearing the collar. Um, and I think, but I think that's, that's the deeper call, right? To be a witness. It's, it's not about just the words that we speak or the things that we can say, but it's something about our very being. I think it's the people who, you know, you're willing to, to step out onto your block and be present even with all the stuff that might be happening in, in, in your block or on your, in your neighborhood. But just being present makes you weird, right? Like that, that's not what most people, especially if you live here, maybe on the south side of the city, like that would make you seem strange. Uh, and some people might take offense to the fact that, that you would be willing to do that. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes it's the, it is what we say, it's, it's what we speak about, or it's what we ask people not to speak about around us. Um, the jokes or the stories or you know language which you know I'm not judging anybody on that because mm -hmm. I have work to do but mm -hmm. uh, but it's in those moments of being able to say like no like I'm trying to live in this way and even even doing that I think can be a witness mm -hmm. to other people mm -hmm. and I think that's why you know the the whole thing in verse 29 is I think where it comes home is yes. that they're not the, the apostle it says in my translation, but Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than any human authority or any, or any man. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't concerned about Offend. offending what they were doing. It does, and that doesn't mean that they were disrespectful. Yeah. But the place that they went was back to the temple because that's where the Spirit led them to go. To do what? To preach about Jesus. It was never about themselves. And I think that's, the, that's where... For us as disciples, missionary disciples, trying to live in our world today, that's the place that we're always invited to, and this is the place we should be trying to get to, is a, a place that is not about us, mm. but it's about what the Spirit is calling us to do, and leading us to do, and prompting us to do. And I think if we're doing that, then you genuinely don't care yeah. what other people might think. And I've had to learn that, you know, as a pastor. Um, you know, at one time, I think it was probably more important for me to be liked by everyone or by people. That's not possible. Because I think when you're exercising your leadership and when you're exercising this gift of the spirit, working and, and moving and, and trying to help discern that, it's going to offend people. Yes. 
And it means you're going to make decisions that people don't like mm-hmm. or people don't understand or people mm-hmm. disagree with. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, it's about paying attention to the fruits of that yes. and seeing. Because yes. that's what I think the apostles knew, right? Exactly. When they were teaching and as people were being converted, exactly. they knew that what they were doing was making a difference. That's how it wasn't just about them. And yes. that's what probably gave them some trust to keep going. Exactly. Beautiful. And I think, you see, as I read St. Luke, Luke acts. One of, the, one of the big things for Luke is also the prophetic, what mm-hmm. we call the prophetic. Because Jesus came as a prophet. You remember in Luke chapter 4, in the synagogue, when he opened the scriptures, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, mm-hmm. for he has sent me hmm, to bring good news to the poor. Quoting Isaiah 61, it was the prophetic. Jesus, in Jesus, we see the prophetic manifested. And Luke continues that tradition in Acts. So the church is a prophetic church. Mm-hmm. See, who is a prophet? You know, in, in Hebrew, a pro- Nabim, the prophet is the spokesperson for God. And so you really write by the way the prophets live. Look at the daily readings mm-hmm. that we're taking these is. Who was it? E- e- Elijah? Yeah, Elijah. And yeah, Ahab. You remember Ahab and all these things. How? You know, Mount Carmel, the confrontation with the false prophets. 450 of them, he says, I'm the only one left, you know. But let's put the sacrifice there, you know. How Jezebel and, and, you know, they went after him. But this is what prophets do. So the church must be a voice. The church must be prophetic. And I think you see that a lot. I'm glad you brought verse 29 because... Again and again, it goes to but Peter and the apostles. You remember? Mm-hmm. So Peter is the only is the one who stands up and speaks. Our first pope, you know. So Peter and the apostles respond. We must obey God rather than men. Hmm? The God of our ancestors. And he goes in 